Hi everyone, my name is Bina Amana. Thank you so much for joining Monitor Deloitte's Transform, Rinse, Repeat LinkedIn Live event. To navigate what's next in an uncertain environment, executives need bold strategies and transformation programs that fuel growth. With a 30-year history of helping businesses grow, Monitor Deloitte is your ally in shaping and operationalizing business change. We don't stop at strategy, we go the full distance. As trusted collaborators, we work closely through the entire process, from idea to execution, to help drive end-to-end -end transformation. We continuously optimize business models and create lasting business value. We also combine industry insights with corporate technology and transformation strategy capabilities to embed durable impact and advantage. With that, we have a very special session today, and let me welcome my colleague, Rich Nanda, to lead us through the discussion. Thank you, Veena, and uh, thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, my name is Rich Nanda. I'm the practice leader here at Monitor Deloitte in the U.S., and I'm the um, co-author of the new re release Transformation Myth book. Um, and I'm joined today by my co-authors um, of the book. And, um, as we've talked about in prior uh, LinkedIn Live events, the book is really the in inspiration for Transform, Rinse, Repeat, which is you know, all about being in a dynamic business environment, um, needing to navigate disruption, adopt new digital technologies that connect to how companies compete and win, and do that in a transformative way over and over and over. Um, and, and again, the um, you know, the inspiration from this was our work on the book. So maybe what I'll do first is uh, just ask my co-authors to introduce themselves. Let's start with you, Jerry. Hi, my name is Jerry Kane. I'm a professor of information systems at Boston College and the faculty director of the Edmund H. Shea Center for Entrepreneurship as well. Um, Hi, everyone. I'm Ann Phillips. Um, I am the research director for Deloitte's Global CEO Program. Um, I spent the past 10 years researching these topics around transformation, and prior to that, did a lot of uh, technology implementation for our Deloitte clients. And I'm Jonathan Kapolsky. So I teach at Northwestern University. I'm also the executive director of the Medill Spiegel Research Center and a retired partner from Deloitte Consulting. All right, team. Um, well, let's dig into it. So. Um, maybe, Jerry, you can start by just talking a little bit about why the book, what was the genesis, um, and why did you think it was an important piece to write about? Yeah, so it's actually an interesting story because um, three of us were authors on a previous book uh, published in 2019 called uh, The Technology Fallacy, How People Are the Real Key to Digital Transformation. And that book was the result of basically five years of research in conjunction with Deloitte and MIT Sloan Management Review, really looking at how legacy companies were adapting to a digital world. <clears throat> we published that book, really proud of it. Um, and then we were beginning to think about the sequel to that book, beginning to prepare for it. And in fact, we had a um, uh, we had a, a meeting set up with the uh, editors of MIT Press to pitch this follow up. And that meeting was set for March of 2020. And of course, when we go into that room, the world is changing around us. Um, that obviously at that point, we knew things were going to be radically different as a result of COVID-19. Uh, and so in that pitch meeting, we pivoted our proposal and said, what if we investigate this phenomena as companies are reacting to it, as companies are adapting to COVID? Because what we were finding was that a number of the lessons from the technology fallacy really applied to what companies were struggling and wrestling with. Um, and that's what gave rise to this book. And it was both a rewarding and a stressful um, experience to try and investigate this phenomena as we were living through it and publishing a book and researching a book um, <clears throat> when we didn't quite know what the end was, state was going to be like. And so uh, we had a number of really fascinating interviews with very inspiring leaders uh, that were leading their organization through this change. Um, 
and uh, really learned a lot in the process. And I think the result is this transformation myth, leading your organization through uncertain times. Uh, and I I'm particularly proud uh, of, of what we were able to come up with, particularly since it was under duress in such a short period of time. Yeah, great. Thank you. Thanks, Jerry, for that um, for that introduction to how we got to the book. Um, I'm going to ask Ann and Jonathan, maybe on you first, to just talk a bit about the, the tech fallacy as a baseline for the audience today and what you thought some of the key lessons from, from that were. Uh, before I hand it over to you, Ann, though, just a reminder to the audience, we'd love to hear from you um, in the comments with the questions that you have. Um, for any of us. Um, we'll obviously um, cover a handful of things that we have pre-planned here, but hope to spend a majority of the time answering your questions. Okay, An, why don't we start with you? Talk a little bit about what you thought some yeah. of the big takeaways were from the tech fallacy. So, you know, as Jerry mentioned, we base the technology fallacy on five years plus of research that we did with MIT. And, you know, what we learned during that time was that it, this whole concept of digital transformation was actually not really about the technology in the sense that, that um, it was about implementing technologies, but it really was about how do you actually take advantage of that. And the levers that you had to pull to do that were around strategy. They were around leadership. They were around talent and how do you manage your organization? So how do you use those as driving factors for success? transformations as opposed to just leading with the technology. Um, so that was really at the heart of the technology fallacy. And what we found out during that time was there were lots of barriers that organizations had in terms of making progress on, on transformation and becoming more digital. And a lot of those barriers were internal. I mean, they, they were the organizations holding you know, themselves back. Um, they were organizational inertia. They were you know, not prioritizing the concepts or, or um, not prioritizing transformation enough, not prioritizing digital enough. And what we've seen during the past 18 months with the pandemic is that some of those barriers were completely stripped away. Um, so, you know, the fact that organizations had to act quickly, that was what pushed them, you know, beyond the inertia that they initially felt. How about you, Jonathan? What, what, uh, what yeah, thank you. Way for you? Yeah, thank you. And, and I'll just piggyback on what Ann said. So one of the themes that emerged in the book Technology Fallacy was this concept of digital maturity. And we talked about companies being early stages to those which were still in the process of being digitally mature, or what we call them digitally maturing companies. And, and one of the things that we saw, as Ann said, being digitally mature was not about using technology, but aligning the people the structure, the culture, and the processes to take advantage of those technologies. And as I've talked about this book and described it to people, what I it really struck me was the degree to which digitally maturing companies are so proficient at learning and learning quickly and learning new ways to use technology and learning how to spread that learning throughout the organization. And this notion of uh, speed of learning particularly emerged when we started to do the research for the current book, The Transformation Myth. And I was struck by a recurrent theme that we heard from individuals that we interviewed. And that was, we did in days and weeks what used to take us months and years. I love it. Um, who wouldn't want to be the fastest learner on the block in this you know, day, day and age? Um, let's, so let's shift gears now that we have the baseline on the technology fallacy. Let's talk about the transformation myth. Um, maybe each of us can opine for a second on what we actually think the myth is. So Jerry, t to you first. Yeah, so <clears throat> I think the transformation myth uh, is really about this misbelief that um, as you engage in transformation, whether it's a result of digital, whether it's a result of COVID, whatever, that somehow it's eventually going to be done. Uh, what we found in our various interviews was that people were referencing things like the 2008 financial crisis, the 2001 terror attacks, the dot-com 
boom and bust and Y2K as models for how to respond uh, to disruption. And that's sort of the spirit of this book um, is that disruption, I don't think is a one and done thing. I think we are living in an era of disruption these days. Um, and so how to learn to lead amidst, how to learn to manage uh, amidst this constant disruption, I think is the real leadership challenge going forward. And what was most inspirational to me was the countless, um, uh, the number of really inspirational stories we heard of really outstanding corporate leadership. One of our interviewees is actually on the call to, or on the webinar today. I saw Kristen Darby, uh, formerly of Envision Health, uh, who we interviewed, who led her organization um, as they were sort of managing all the ERs in the New York and New Jersey area at prime COVID time. How do you respond um, to that uh, level of disruption. Um, and if we, maybe we can get Lancey to drop in the chat, the Deloitte link to where these interviews have been published. Um, so we were able to publish a lot of these profiles in the Wall Street Journal uh, because the stories we were telling of leading through disruption, we just couldn't fit them all in the book. And we wanted to highlight some of the really outstanding um, examples of leadership we saw um, during this during this time. So that was a little bit of a plug as well as answering the question. So sorry if I got off reservation for a bit. That, that's that's perfect. Plug away. Uh, Jonathan, do you want to talk? Like the, how, how would you characterize the myth uh, as, you know, in your mind following the work? I think you might be muted. John. Yes, thank you. Uh, once again, piggybacking on what Jerry just said. So, you know, the, the um, he, Jerry, in an earlier response, used the word pivot. And interesting enough, the Association of National Advertisers, that was the word of 2020, was pivot. And um, what I think I learned as we do this, and we had that meeting back in March 2020, and one of our concerns was, by the time we finish this book, COVID might be gone. And the reality is, Unfortunately, it's not gone, but there will continue to be acute disruptions like that, which affect all companies over time. And learning how to cope with that is an important part of what will make companies resilient and sustainable. So to me, the myth is this notion of the world is not a series of projects that you do complete and then move on to the next one. When it comes to digital transformation, that's an ongoing struggle for every company. And, you know, I love uh, what Andy Grove said many years ago, only the paranoid survive. So I think that's particularly relevant in this world of digital transformation. We need to be paranoid both about the external disruptions and the internal challenges that we face in trying to harness the power of these digital technologies. On any, any thoughts you'd like to add? You know, um, Jerry and Jonathan summed it up so well. I, I think at the end of the day, it's really about continual evolution as opposed to if I put these things into my company, if I, you know, digitize my company, if I shift from analog to digital, then I've, I've gotten where I need to go. And really, it isn't about that. It's about how do you get to a place where you're constantly scanning the horizon um, and constantly evolving for the next that's going to happen and be prepared for the unexpected. Um. Maybe I'll just add one, you know, one thought here, uh, which is, if you know, if you accept that, um, you know, transformation is a myth, meaning the one and done is a myth. There's no end state or finish line. Um, you know, there's a real implication on enterprises that transformation needs to be um, a capability, a core discipline that the company and its leaders can sustain. Um, and it's not a one-time project team to set up um, and then wind down, right? Rather, it's a you know constant state of absorbing, uh, understanding, and then you know responding and thriving to uh, to these disruptions. So there was an interesting question in the the chat from Kyle Nicholson. Kyle, thanks for the question um, about what's the most disruptive application of ML and AI that we've seen. I think maybe we can answer Kyle's question, but just also talk about sort of the nature of disruption. There's a chapter in the book, I think that, um, you know, the readers will find useful um, as a frame for that. Jerry, do you want to just talk about kind of how we characterize disruption and then also um, answer Kyle's question? Yeah. So you're are you talking about the acute uh, chronic? Yeah. 
distinction. So when we were trying to figure out how the technology fallacy fit, um, we actually went back to, to a, a medical example and talked about acute versus chronic disruption. And digital disruption, which is what we studied before, is really what we call the chronic disruption. It happens over a long period of time. You can sort of ignore it for a while and live life as normal um, and, and manage it. Whereas acute disruption is like a heart attack. It happens very quickly. You have no choice but to respond. And that's what COVID was for many organizations. What's really striking um, is that when we spoke to people about what they were doing, they said COVID didn't actually change many of their plans in, at, at all. It just accelerated the plans they had in place. So it wasn't about something that was fundamentally different. They, most companies knew they were moving in this direction, but it was that this increased urgency uh, to get it done. And that's what really moved many of these transformation efforts forward at a massive time frame. And one thing I was really surprised at is how many of the digital leaders talked about COVID in positive terms, in terms of business transformation. They were really able to get stuff done that they'd not been able to do before. Um, so then in response to Kyle's specific question, we have a couple of examples. One in the book was from Anthem. Um, and how they used AI on their patient data, not to monitor COVID, um, but to see, okay, once we were getting through the first wave of COVID, who were the first set of patients that we needed to make sure got back in the office as quickly as possible to deal with pre-existing conditions? And so we're doing a triage of the medical records to identify the patients um, that were mo most needed. I saw Kristen said in the chat that they were using AI to be able to sort of help monitor COVID at an early stage. And we also saw that from, from Siemens Healthcare, you know, that they were able to take their a lot of their CT equipment, uh, change the software to be able to sort of begin to monitor for COVID uh, symptoms. And once you have that digital infrastructure in place, using AI to sort of change the nature of what that digital central infrastructure does uh, can be a game changer. Yeah. The, the way I like to think about that is um, in the Anthem example or the Envision, you know, the, the, the data on patients um, was always there. The ability to harness that data as an asset for better customer or patient care, um, that's net new, right? And that's 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 taking advantage of um, these new disruptive technologies in a very positive way. Um, hey, Hilton Rich, I see Barber. Hilton Barber's comment in there yeah. uh, talking about Hopefully. scenario planning. I wonder if you yeah. could talk about scenario planning and whether we actually <laughs> address it in the book. I, I was trying to remember what chapter it was, but it was it's one of the earlier chapters. Um, it, we do have a chapter in the book about uh, scenario planning, Hilton. And um, the, the premise being that, that, yes, indeed, in increasingly uncertain times, um, understanding you know, which variables um, really impact your business the most, and then building scenarios around those most uncertain variables um, is an important discipline, right? And that just creates a level of um, preparedness across scenarios that really matter. So it focuses you on the uncertainty that really matters, um, lets you build scenarios to deal with those, and it lets you understand what your no regret actions are. What are the things we should be doing regardless of you know which future plays out? Um, the other thing we've seen um, many of our clients doing now is automating and applying digital technologies to how scenario plans are built and then monitored over time. Because there's no reason that should just be you know a human set of activities to track the way uncertainties are playing out. So, Rich, we do talk about it in chapter one. Oh, thank you, Jonathan. One of we, we it's front and center, Hilton, in terms of the uh, the flow of the book. And I remember when we talked to to Chris and Darby that she talked about scenario planning as essential. You know, not they didn't scenario plan for. Um, for COVID, but scenario planning for natural disasters, other types of crises could be changed over. And also with the, the analog devices interview, Dan, um, name is Leibowitz. Leibowitz, you know, talked about how they had done a scenario planning 
uh, instance, like 18 months before COVID, and they went back and looked at it, and many of the things they had talked about, scenarios they had thought about, to differing levels of severity, but all had been playing out with respect to COVID, even though they didn't, you know, scenario plan a crisis at all. And there's another uh, interesting question that's come in. Let me pose it and then see who wants to take it. But can you, um, from this is from Dar Daria Raja. Can you please talk about the underlying economics of innovation and disruption, the cost of striving? This is something we actually talked a bit about last night with uh, some Jerry students as well. Yeah, look, I can jump in and start, and I'm sure that Ana and Jerry can amplify what I say. But you know, one of the things we talk in the book is thinking about digital transformation as enabling capabilities. And right, so we've got these three tiers of capabilities. There are foundational capabilities, which are things that we need to do, and those are not differentiating. There are those capabilities, which are core capabilities, which are part of what you need to do to be in a specific industry, and then the strategic capabilities. And you know, what we've seen is those foundational and core, sometimes they don't have a huge amount of return on them, but they're critical to get into the strategic capabilities. So when you start talking about the economics, the payoff comes with the ability to go from foundational and core into those strategic areas. And, and some of those economics change because of these acute disruptions. So when I think of my favorite instance of new innovations and particularly around machine learning and AI, it has to do with uh, drive-through lines in restaurants, quick service restaurants. And we did a number of conversations with McDonald's and Portillo's, which is our favorite drive through restaurant here in Chicago. But I love what McDonald's has done in terms of using uh, machine learning to identify license plate numbers and then use the knowledge of past behaviors on the part of those customers to then populate their digital menu boards. And it's so simple, uh, but yet it's such an elegant way. And what they've discovered is that that both improves the velocity of people coming through the drive through lane, but also improves the average ticket price too. Honor, Jerry, anything you guys would want to add around the economics? On you. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting um, when you talk about the investments required to to innovate, right? I mean, you, you have to accept a certain amount of that. So you either pay for it now or you pay for it um, when you're in a bind, when you're in acute disruption. Um, so it, it is something that you have to plan for as an organization. As Jonathan talked about, start with some of your ambitions, right? What are you trying to achieve as an organization? Where do you want to go? Um, how are you going to, you know, where are you going to play and how are you going to win in terms of your um, strategic moves? And then from that, figure out where to make your investments um, in terms of experimenting, learning, studying the, the technologies, playing around with the technologies, learning from them and figuring out how to turn that into growth for your organization. Um, so that's ultimately what it's about. It's about focusing on that ahead of time rather than waiting for something to happen and being forced to then invest in this. Yeah, and the only thing, the only add on I would have to what Andra said, which I agree with wholeheartedly, but we have the concept of optionality in the book, which is, you know, sort of like the financial options where you make a small investment now to have the right to purchase a security later or the right to take an action in the future. By invest making these investments now, you may not be going whole hog into any of these things. You may just be getting pilots going. You may just be talking to leading providers. You may just be sort of making sure you have an idea of what the environment is so when you do need to execute on it you can do it in a very short period of time one of our interviewees said you know we were able to sort of add on some certain cloud capabilities in a very short time frame but he said i would hate to be starting from scratch to do that research um, but because we had done that research and because we had that made that small investment of time and energy and money at the early stage that gave us the freedom to make that option uh, and, ex and exercise that option when we need to. So making sure you have lots of experiments and lots of small investments so when the future does become clear, you can move quickly. Yeah, I, I think the you know the other important aspect here is, is having a growth versus a fixed mindset. Um, and so that's not to say that, you know, 
companies can afford to be irresponsible with their investments and economics around innovation and transformation. But as Jerry described, a growth mindset would say, we're going to set aside, you know, X percent of our budget to build innovation and future optionality. And our observation was all of the companies we talked to that very early on in the pandemic were able to respond, whether it was virtualization of work or the supply chain, new customer interaction models, the ones that were able to respond um, most quickly and effectively had started their option development in 2018 and 2019 through experiments and, and learning. And so there was a base of knowledge and capability to, to build on. Um, so, you know, having that, this growth mindset um, really does lead to more options on the table. Okay, we're a little past the halfway point. Um, I think we should spend some time talking about um, leadership um, and then also some time talking about the people aspects um, of transformation as well. So maybe um, I'll kick it off and then let's see what the audience might have on, you know, in those themes as well. But um, what leadership traits stood out um, for each of you as we did our research uh, about companies that you know, seem to get this uh, repeat transformation um, thing down well? Uh, Go ahead, on. Over yeah. to you, on. Well, I, I think that there are a lot of different leadership traits, but the, the one that stuck out to me the most, especially during this whole period, um, and that came out you know, very clearly in the transformation myth, with the concept of the leader as, as a communicator, as an authentic leader who communicates. Um, and we've seen you know, with, through all, all of our interviews pretty much that there's been um, a, a strong increase in not just the frequency of communication from leaders, especially CEOs, um, but also a certain degree of authentic, authenticity that came out that, that wasn't there before. Um, so I think it, especially in acute disruptions, especially in times of uncertainty, that communication is absolutely critical. Um, and that's the one thing that leaders can't really delegate, right? I mean, you, you have to um, be there to sort of set the direction, set the vision, and, and constantly communicate to your people about where you're going as an organization. So that's the one thing um, that I would say. I mean, but there's a, a whole list of other things, too. Yeah, if you go back to the earlier book. Jerry or Jonathan, any any thoughts that? Yeah, I was going to say, on if you go back to the earlier book that we did, The Technology Fallacy, the two things that really emerged for me as leadership characteristics, one which was inspirational vision, getting people to follow you, and then the second was the willingness to experiment and take risks. And those emerged both as what people wanted, but also what they wanted to see more of. And I'd say, if anything, the research for the transformation myth reinforced that, you know, in spades about the importance of both of those. And um, you know, we talk in the book about the having a purpose, having a mission, having values, and how employees appreciate that so much more at a time where they, we are living this great uncertainty. And I often refer people to this wonderful video that I watched with Arnie Sorensen, the former CEO, he's passed away from cancer of Marriott. And he did this, see this presentation, you can watch it on YouTube, in the end of March of 2020, talking about the changes they were making at Marriott. And he appears in it, uh, he's bald because of the radiation treatment that he was getting. But the level of empathy that he emanates was just absolutely outstanding to me. So the need for that empathy, the need to be able to talk about mission, values, and vision, both with employees, but also with customers and suppliers, I think increased by um, mega amounts uh, during COVID. Yeah, I'll, I'll just conclude with echoing that about the importance of setting the mission and communicating that, or the purpose and communicating that purpose as being particularly important uh, in times of disruption and uncertainty. I never heard the term North Star as often as I did in the interviews we had. And a couple of great examples. One that comes to mind is Albert Bellotti of Beam Suntory. So in his talk to his employees, he said, I never thought I'd communicate as much as I've been doing. In his uh, 
communication to his employees a week or two after COVID was sort of like teeth set in, he basically articulated our respond, recover, thrive framework to his entire organization. The first thing we're going to do is keep the lights on and take care of our people. Second thing we're going to do is figure out where the business opportunities are. And the third thing we're going to do um, is make sure we win in those business opportunities. Another great one is Doug Mack from Fanatics, um, the sportswear uh, provider. And he said, you know, there's going to be all sorts of opportunities here. Um, and we need to raise money to be able to take advantage of those opportunities. And they did two different rounds of fundraising at $350 million each um, just to amass a war chest to innovate um, in these times through mergers and acquisitions. Um, another great example, so Andy Rubin of Trove talked about how this was our moment. We knew that, that COVID was our moment and we couldn't miss that moment. And then the last thing, I know I'm just like ranting on, you know, interview or examples, but I, I just, it's you're, you're giving so the whole book away. <laughs> well, they'll still have to buy it. Um, <laughs> but I'll give a shout out to um, Michael Aldrich from Humana, who I also see is on the call. You know, Humana, in the early days of the pandemic, as they were talking to their customers, it became, it became clear that food insecurity was a real issue that their uh, their members were having. And you know, Humana is a health insurance company. They weren't expecting to you know they don't know anything about food delivery, but they said Michael and his team said, look, if our mission is really about working towards the best health of our customer. Our mission has changed in this environment and we need to figure out how to address this need. And they ramped up food production capabilities and delivery capabilities to deliver a million meals in the first uh, few months of, of the COVID pandemic. And so that sort of leadership reinterpreting the mission for the changing conditions on the ground uh, is, I think, the really key thing of leadership. And that's not just senior leadership, but even someone, you know, uh, middle management like Michael to say, here's the opportunity. We need to make this happen and to make that happen. And that's what really inspired me throughout all of our interviews were those examples of people just not just management, but leadership uh, in this time. Um, yeah. Sorry, you can tell them. And, and you know the other the other interesting thing too, Jerry, about that as you were talking about leadership, and I think it's important to note that during this time, you know, sort of pushing that leadership and pushing a lot of decision making down to to where you, you know it, it really makes a difference. I think was it was a big thing. That was the way that organizations were able to stay nimble, right? Um, you couldn't have everything just driven to top down. So there has to be a certain amount of um, stepping up to leadership. Um, and 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 really putting a lot of trust in your people. Yeah, uh, there's a comment here that's acknowledging the many stories in the book, and I'll just say the um, you know a key part of our process was talking to a lot of executives across sectors, and and Jerry mentioned that in his opening, but just wanted to to emphasize um, you know how important. Uh, executive dialogue was to our research and in, in guiding the work. Um, and those are all throughout the book. So, you know, it's uh, we're sharing our perspectives, you know, based upon our our, our insights and our and our work, but it's backed up then with lots of um, real-time examples from 2020 um, of incredible successes. You know, so lots of thanks to, to all the executives, many of whom are on the line, which is great to see. Um, there was, I'm going to go backwards in the chat a little bit, Jerry. There was a, a, a question here that I'll summarize, which is, hey, if, if COVID was an accelerant, does that mean everybody had had it figured out ahead of time and it just made their plans go faster? Um, but well, how would you react to that uh, that question? Yeah, I mean, a lot of it was not rocket science you know it's a lot of what was happening we already saw on the wall the difference is the courage the difference is the resolve and you know when you're sitting around like doing all the roi analyses and should we do this and how fast should we go and like overthinking things what covid made us do is just we got to do this um when the roi is survive or not survive it it creates a bias towards action um, and i think that's what it did that um you know many companies um absolutely knew, uh, knew what needed to happen i would argue most companies weren't in 2020 digitally they were in 20, 2010 um, and this you know got them up to the present and i think what's going to be really interesting 
And this, I think, is the message of the book that we want to make sure comes out and, and is the essence of the transformation myth. When COVID is done, whenever the heck that's going to be, the period of innovation isn't over, it's only beginning. Because we think the capabilities that um, companies have developed over the last 18 months, when the shackles are off and we are now unconstrained by COVID, we see that as being you know, a, the golden age of digital innovation that, that's yet to come. And so for executives, I think the thing is now you need to spend time thinking what that future is going to be like, whether that's about return to work and what that looks like. Don't just go back to December of 2019. Um, those are the companies that will struggle going forward. The companies that say, OK, what do we take from pre-2019 to the COVID? And how do we combine those to create a workplace that's the best of both worlds? How do we take the capabilities that we developed in COVID combined with the freedom now that we have um, now that we're sort of on the other side of the pandemic, how do we do that to create new opportunities uh, of where to play, how to win? And my, my fear is that companies are going to go, Ooh, we've survived. We can no, now go back to the old way of things. Uh, and I think those companies are going to struggle. The message I really want to say is the time for innovation is now. Take what we've learned, uh, those massive advances, those inspirational leadership stories, and use it to come out of the pandemic even stronger and more capable, more nimble, more resilient, more competitive than you ever were before. And I think if there's a message of the book now, that's what it is. Yeah, Rich, I, I would say that certainly we saw many instances where COVID uh, exacerbated some of the challenges that companies had and forced them to accelerate their efforts. But I, I do think there are other places we saw companies doing pivots, changing what they were making, changing the service that they were doing changing fundamentally how they're going to. There are a number of comments in the comments about telemedicine. So it's a great example of how you know, telemedicine has been around for a long time, but because of endogenous circumstances, all of a sudden companies had to pivot to deliver. And to Jerry's point, I don't think everybody who's enjoyed the use of telemedicine is naturally is always going to go back to exactly the way it was before. We did an article for MIT SMR about the post-pandemic workplace. I think we've learned new ways of work at Northwestern. We were forced to do all of our classes on Zoom. And what we discovered was, you know, there were some new things we could do on Zoom that we could do in face-to-face -face classes. I'm sure Jerry's had the same experience to having guests come in to speak to my students where they don't need to travel all the way to Evanston, Illinois, was something I never could have done before with our prior technology. So I think it's a combination of acceleration, but also I would not underestimate the degree to which many companies pivoted both in terms of how they operated, services they offered, the relationship with customers, panels that they use, et cetera. I'd say to, to offer two things. One, I. I, I couldn't agree more that this is really a golden era and hopefully the readers um, you know, that uh, you can appreciate that we're entering this golden era of innovation and opportunity. Um, to, just to agree and amplify Jerry's point there. But, and the one thing I'd say about you know, COVID as an accelerant and did it, you know, were all companies equally prepared? They weren't, right? And I think there's, there's building blocks that companies have put in place over time that are what allowed them to cope and thrive amidst uncertainty. There's leadership building block blocks, there's workforce building blocks, there's technology and the new capabilities um, building blocks, there's, there's building blocks around customer relationships. And, and those that had invested in the building blocks over time, they've actually thrived more quickly amidst all this disruption and other companies are still still struggling and uh, you know, certain things have been accelerated and others so, so it's not that this is preordained that everyone's going to be successful I actually think it's a golden era but it's also an era where where winners and losers will um, continue to, to emerge all right there's been a bunch of questions that have come in so I'm going to try and um, I'll come to your Adam Salem to you. You have a question specifically on hospitality, tourism industry, and with um, 
this kind of the uh, the challenge environment they had, as well as you know a very experience based business. What what's the best way for them to navigate um, during such times? And we did talk to a number of hospitality companies. Anyone want to take that one first? Sure, I'll go because I was the one. You know, I, um, you know, we did that was uh, hospitality was one of those really interesting ones, and we were able to interview. Um, two leaders, both at Marriott and at Hilton, because, you know, they just, you know, we talk about all the, like the good things that happened, um, but let's not forget, you know, it was awful for many organizations and, um, you know, hospitality experienced a 90% decrease in demand overnight. And it's just like, how does anybody lead through that? I mean, it's not like you can, oh, if you, they only were, you're smarter, they would have not, or a more courageous leader that they wouldn't have experienced that. No, I mean, there's, there was nothing those people could have done. Um, and it was the, the, the degree to which it was affecting them was, was clear when we interviewed them. I think what was interesting for those companies, what, and they did it in very different ways. Uh, Marriott innovated by taking their call center employees and pivoting the entire unit to go from taking reservations, which were not coming, to now helping the state of New York process the hundredfold increase in unemployment claims that happened. And that was just sort of a really sort of visionary way to how do we pivot our resources to deal with the problem, uh, help somebody else, as well as keep ourselves still relevant. So how do we meet a need that, how do we rethink our capabilities to meet those needs? Hilton was another really exa interesting example. They knew they were gonna have to lay people off. Um, they uh, reversed their recruitment system. So the, the recruiting system that brought people into positions into Hilton, they created partnerships with Amazon and with UPS and grocery stores and others who saw an increase in demand um, that basically gave Hilton uh, employees a preferred portal to get jobs with these companies. And the the Amazons and UPSs loved it because they knew these people were vouched for by Hilton. The employees loved it because Hilton, they felt like Hilton was taking care of them uh, as employees. And what was remarkable about that, despite laying off 50,000 people in 2020, Hilton was still rated the third best place to work uh, in America by whatever For Fortune or Forbes uh, study that was. And, and the reason it was attributed was because they felt like they treated their employees with humanity and respect. Uh, and when they did that, they're, they're, Hilton was banking on when demand came back, we're going to need these employees back. And if we treat them right now, they're going to want to return rather than leaving bitter. And and we see that playing out. So, you know, nothing was going to save hospitality in that moment. But these leaders were able to think create creatively to use the resources they had to sort of mitigate the damage and and live on to fight another day. Right. And, and I think the leadership lessons, the capability lessons are now all applying as demand is returning and they're innovating to um, meet and take care of that demand in a uh, in this current environment. And, and you're seeing that um, as, uh, as travel recovers and those companies are responding with innovation in kind. So, you know, it was in that respond. And now that we're in this recover and thrive mode, you're seeing the innovation, the focus of that innovation pivot. So just, just a couple minutes left, um, any surprises about writing the book that you think would be interesting to share with the, the group? Yeah, I would start with this. <laughs> we, did, we, we did that pivot, as Jerry suggested, back in March of 2020. But the thing which was a surprise was the degree to which we did this whole thing virtually. <laughs> and we were able to go through this process um, in a very different world than a world in which we could get together face to face. And I, I think that was a pleasant surprise for all of us, the lack of friction uh, with which we were able to execute that and the speed. And, and frankly, you know, we were you know, eating our own dog food, so to speak, in terms of thinking about nimbleness and scalability and stability and optionality as we did this. I'd, I'd also say, you know, this, what makes the book is the stories and um, how willing people were to talk about what they were doing is uh, grateful to all those individuals who participated in our interviews, some of whom are on the call, and, and really told us about 
you know, some of the challenges, but also some of their optimism that they had about making it through this. And I think you were going to jump in with a surprise. Oh, no, I was, um, my biggest surprise is the thing that we were all worried about, which was the timing of the book release and whether or not we would actually get all of this right because we were writing it as it was unfolding before us, um, turned out to not be an issue, but yeah. We were either really smart or really lucky, uh, and I'm not sure which is which. Well, we'll 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 take whatever credit you know we might get I, either way. Um, yeah, and for me, it's the um, you know the 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 fact that even today, you know, the disruptions stemming from the initial disruption, you know, continue to come, um, and they continue to be overlapping, and this ability to navigate and thrive amidst uncertainty is, is um, you know, we're seeing it every day within our client work and in the newspaper. And there's some real permanence to the lessons in the book. And that's been a very pleasant surprise. Um, so we'll wrap it up here. I thank all of you so much for joining us today, um, for sharing your questions, hopefully for buying the book. And if you enjoy the book, do give us a positive review, not to, uh, um, not too uh, ashamed to ask for that uh, here. Thank you so much to my co-authors. Um, been a pleasure having you here today as it's been um, working with you. And we'll see you next month on our next uh, Transformer and Repeat. More to come on that in the coming days. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.